When injury takes you out of the game, it's time for your team to step up. At Alina Health Orthopaedics, you'll get expert care backed by a whole health system of providers. With convenient locations, virtual options, and an app that gives you 24-7 access to your records, test results, and care team, you're always close to the care that you need. Schedule now at alinahealth.org slash ortho. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when this finds you. Welcome to the Sound of the Loons podcast presented by Alina Health Orthopedics. I am Steve McPherson, and I'm joined by Callum Williams. I, I actually have the same copy here because the same thing is true. As we enjoy an international break here before Minnesota United's next game on June 19th against FC Dallas and their first game back at Allianz Field with just about full capacity against Austin FC. Very excited for that game. It'll be the uh, the Pride game. Uh, I've been doing some fun uh, uh, Pride stuff uh, with some, some interviews. Uh, I talked to John Gallagher uh, and Adrian Fox of the, the Grey Ducks. Uh, a great uh, sort of league team system here in Minnesota for uh, LGBTQ players. Uh, I'll have some stuff up on them shortly. Uh, very excited. Happy Pride, everybody. Uh, happy game week. It's it's happening now. I, I sort of, it feels like it's, it feels like it's been a while, doesn't it, Cal? It feels like it's been an eternity. And it's, it's always the same, isn't it? And then I bet you when we actually start things again, Steve, it'll feel like, oh, well, actually, didn't we just do this? Um, especially with the consistent nature of games that are about to appear on the calendar as well. It's going to be Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday for yeah. for what will feel again like an eternity, I'm sure, which is okay. It's fine because it means Major League Soccer's back and we're okay with that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I did look at the schedule coming up, and it's uh, it's pretty packed. There's not a lot of uh, breathing room for the rest of the season, so things are going to get uh, pretty intense pretty quickly. Uh, for this uh, international break, let's let's uh, get some Euro 2020 updates. Uh, how have you been enjoying the Euro festivities, Cal? They've been great, Steve. Uh, that and the Copper America. Um, it, it's been wonderful to watch, um, and I. What I love, Steve, is that I actually think that we are extremely fortunate to live in this time zone because it's essentially soccer all day. You know, I woke up this morning to watch uh, Finland, Russia at eight in the morning. Uh, then as I was driving back uh, from Minnesota United training, I was able to listen on the radio uh, to um, the Wales game, Wales-Turkey. And then obviously at two o'clock, um, we've got um, Belgium, Denmark, and, and then... I think it's tomorrow is when we have the uh, resumption of, of Copper America and again. So it, it, it's essentially all day. Um, so it's wonderful for a football nerd like myself. I can actually, um, you know, whilst I'm working, have, have the games on in the background. It's wonderful. So um, it, it's been great, Steve. I love international football. It, it, it's just unlike anything else in, in sports. Um, you know, the only thing you can really compare it to is the Olympics. Um, it just... It just means so much because you're not just representing a certain portion of a country. You're representing the whole country. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the one time when uh, a whole country can get together and, and actually agree on something, you know. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll use the UK, for example. Um, I think from a, a political point of view and, and a, a generic lifestyle point of view, I've never seen the UK as, as divided as it is at the moment. But there's one thing I know for sure that everybody will agree on, and that's the England national team. So it, it unites, unlike anything else, international football. Um, and it's been great to watch, Steve. It really has. And, and we're, we're only just getting started as well. We've got another, what, three and a half weeks left. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I feel like I should re I should reorganize my uh, office because my TV is behind me there. Uh, and so I can't really have it on. You know, when we're at the office, it's sort of like down at the end of the row of desks, the way the office was set up previously. So it's like you just sort of have it on. I don't have the greatest setup for watching uh, while I'm at home, but maybe I should just go over to the couch. But then sitting on the couch quickly turns into lying on the couch, which quickly turns mm -hmm. into cracking open a beard. Anyways, it yeah. goes from bad to worse. So sometimes it's better to just sit up straight. Obviously the biggest, uh, one of the biggest stories coming out of uh, the weekend was Christian Eriksen, uh, who had a tremendously scary moment uh, on the pitch uh, for Denmark against Finland, uh, suffering a cardiac arrest and apparently dying for a minute or so uh, until he was, he was revived. Um, obviously a scary moment for everybody who was there. And then, you know, the decision was made to, to continue the game that day. There's been some stuff that's come out about, you know, it wasn't totally under the, in the player's hands. There's like the, the, the 
tournament is scheduled very tightly. You need a certain amount of time between games. If you start postponing games, you run into trouble. But what did you think about that decision uh, to continue the game, uh, you know, just sort of after it being suspended for a little while? It seems to me, it seems, I mean, I don't know what you do. It's, it's tough when you've got a, a tournament like that and a lot of games on the docket. Um, but continuing as a player, when you've just, just essentially seen one of your teammates die and go to the, and then be taken away to the hospital, he was conscious by the time he was leaving, but, uh, but man, scary, really hard to go back to playing in that situation. I think. I, I was stunned, Steve, when I saw the tweet come through from UEFA that, uh, the game was going to be played um, later that day. Um, I couldn't believe it. And the initial, the initial um, information that everybody was given was that the players have agreed to do it. Um, look, we, we don't know if that's the case. There's been a ton of reports suggesting that UEFA gave them three options. Um, and, and none of those options um, seem to suggest any sort of um, empathy or humility, um, that there didn't seem to be anything there, which, like I said, look, we, we, we can only speculate really because uh, we, we've only, we, we've seen the same reports as I'm sure everybody listening and watching this has as well. Um, and, and all I can say, Steve, is that if it is true and UEFA said, you know, we're going to um, give, give award Finland a 3-0 win if you don't play, um, which is sort of semi-standard, um, but I think in this situation, um, I, I don't think it would have hurt anybody to, to play the game the next day, the next morning or something. I understand that fans have made their way there and, and there, would, there would have been an issue with that, I'm sure. But um, when I retuned in to, to the, you know, essentially those couple of minutes before half time um, for the second go around of the game, um, I thought the, what, what was so obvious is that there were still players in shock. And the world feed cameras were, were showing um, Denmark players warming up that were still in tears. T to me, the, the whole the whole situation again um, is is in big bold letters that that you know as as much as we love this game, as much as sport brings us, there's more to life than than this. Um, and that was a very extreme moment. And um, you know we we don't know how players are gonna react individually um some of them may very well need some counseling after that you know you just don't know because as you said you essentially saw um what i'm going to assume is, is a close friend to a lot of those players essentially um essentially come close to death and and um i'll be honest steve i was really really worried when i was sitting at home watching it um and uh you know when when first of all a wonderful solidarity from the the danish players to to surround Christian Eriksen, so the cameras uh, couldn't get the shots. Uh, and, and, you know, I think um, the, the wealthy cameras showed a little bit too much anyway, in my opinion. Um, but I think, um, I, I'll be honest, Steve, I was really, really concerned when the, the towels or flags or whatever was used as barriers um, came up alongside Christian Eriksen. Um, I think I, I, I certainly assumed the worst then um, when he was being when, he, when his body was being carried off. I, I, I thought he had died, mm -hmm. um, and it, it was just not a pleasant watch at all, was it? It wasn't a very nice experience. And um, what I will say, Steve, um, turning it sort of into a positive, if you ever can with this sort of thing, is is I thought ESPN, and, and we can only speak about the American broadcast because that's all we've got access to here. But I thought ESPN did a tremendous job with it. I thought they they really took control of what was a, an exceptional uh, situation. Um, and I thought those on commentary, I thought those who were in the studio handled it as well as they could have. I, I thought they did an impeccable job with it. And, um, you know, they, they should be recognised for that for sure. But, yeah, look, no doubt, Steve, it was, it, it was such a scary moment. Um, and now I wonder what the conversations will be moving forward. I hope there are conversations moving forward. You know, is there, um, is there an issue with him? Um, uh, is, is too much being asked of, of players in, in what is a very condensed schedule, as you, as you mentioned before. Um, are players playing too much football? Um, I don't know. Um, but I think Christian Eriksen, at least from, from the comments I've seen, he's probably just going to lay low for a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me if, if that was it for his tournament and, and <laughs> you wouldn't blame him. Um, essentially, right. he's just saying, 
I've, I've just got to see what, what's going wrong and, and, and what happened here. Um, and quite frankly, I don't blame him. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that there's conversations about, you know, how to handle this in the future, right? If there's, this is the kind of thing where they were sort of making stuff up as they went and this question of, well, you can either, you know, as you said, if there's some reason to stop play, and then the one team can't continue, you know, you can say, well, it's a three, no loss. And that's sort of the standard, but this is a very unstandard kind of situation. So I think those kind of things have to be ironed out to where there is some kind of protocol for, it doesn't seem, it seems like you should be able to figure out if there's a life threatening uh, situation with a player during the game, this is how we're going to proceed from this point. Um, and it's, you know, it's tough, like stuff around, um, I don't know Christian Erickson's particulars. Uh, obviously he's a fit, a uh, young man, he's 29, um, not the kind of person you would imagine having a heart attack, but uh, heart stuff can be really tricky. My dad has struggled with that. Um, you know, he's he's uh, older now and he's struggled, struggled with sort of um, AFib stuff and ir irregular heartbeats and things like that. And it can be really hard to track down and really hard to um, remedy and to know for sure you're doing the right thing. And it's one of those situations where um, conserv a conservative approach is probably better. Uh, I don't... I hope we don't see Christian Erickson again in this in this tournament. He should just he should just lay low. So um, let's talk a little bit about the other side, Finland, who uh, obviously played in that game. I know I, you know obviously there's a lot that was going on, but we do have two uh, people close to home, Robin Lud and Yuka Raitala, who played uh, uh, in that game and looked uh, looked pretty good. Um, Yuka, in particular, had some really nice uh, nice play as a as a fullback. Um, I guess I'll start just by asking, do you think we're going to see him in that fullback role uh, for Minnesota United this season? He obviously has played center back so far, but Kai Debasi is now returned from injury. Uh, obviously, players are going to go in and out. There's injuries. There's international play. There's the compressed schedule. Do you think we'll see Raitala at uh, fullback at some point? I think we'll see Yuka Raitala um, at, at fullback. Um Absolutely, at the season, um, once the season starts up and he's available again, um, he's comfortable on on both uh, both feet. Um, I think traditionally more of a left footed player, but he can clearly play with the right. We saw today in the Finland game, he um, he provided the, the cross for the first goal that the Finns scored that was ultimately offside, which is a shame. But um, look, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Rakula is is um, is a player that gives you a lot. He can play across the, the back line. Um, and, and obviously he, he's been asked a lot. He, he's always going to start higher at the field, Steve, in a five-man back line because they're essentially playing wing back then. It's not quite a full back. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so he's always going to be a little, his starting positions anyway, is always going to be a little higher at the field. That's not necessarily the case with Minnesota United, who tend to play a traditional four at the back. Um, but I, I think we'll see him there at some stage, yeah, because as you mentioned, it's, it's a very, very busy season. Um, there are going to be times when players need a, a rest. There are going to be times when players pick up little injuries here and there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely think we'll see him in, in that wing-back role for sure. And, and obviously, as we've already seen, he can play at centre-half as well. So, um, I, I, I'm, uh, isn't it great, by the way, Steve, to see both him and uh, Robin Lurd, um playing on the international stage and, and representing Minnesota United as they are as well. It's been, it's been great. I think Robin Lurd done done really well over the course of the the last first two games as well. Um, I think um, today against Russia, um, I think they'll be disappointed they didn't get something from that today. Um, like you said, obviously Yuka Raitala, um presented the cross, um, which was finished well. Um, but I, I think, <laughs> um, but um, I, I thought Robin, I thought Robin Lewis will, will perhaps be a little bit disappointed he didn't get the ball at, at feet as much <clears> as he probably would have wanted to. You know, Russia played a high line today, um, and Finland have got this tremendous centre forward called um, Timu Puki, who, who plays for, for Norwich City, and and he presses and presses and presses a bit more, and, and I think him playing off the shoulder. Um, of a high Russian back line um, had had real potential for, for problems. But I don't think the ball got to the feet of Robin Hood enough um, mm. to him to play a ball over the top or slip on through. Um, for uh, Puki, everything seemed to come from out wide. Every attacking aspect seemed to come from out wide from Finland, from what I saw. And um, But that's OK. You know, it, it means they've got a um, they've got a really, really big game against Belgium. Um, and, and, you know, we obviously don't know what the outcome of, of this game will be at uh, 2 o'clock Central. 
a little later today between Denmark and Belgium, but um, Finland will be hoping for a, a tie there for sure. Um, and if that is the case, they've got a genuine chance of going through um, to the next round. But um, regardless, the, the last game for them against Belgium will be absolutely huge. I feel a little sorry for them as well, Steve, the fact that they opened up their tournament in Copenhagen, um, essentially a home game for Denmark. And then they played the second game in St. Petersburg in Russia, essentially a home game for, for Russia as well. So I feel a little bit sorry for them. They've, they've um, not had a chance to have a home crowd themselves, and, and nor will they. You know, Helsinki or anywhere in Finland isn't, isn't a designated um, uh, event space for, for Euro 2020. But, um, you know, they've had to deal with, with essentially two home crowds uh, and two home teams. So um, putting that into perspective, they've actually done really, really well. Uh, and like I said, they'll be... Uh, looking at this game later today for sure, um, and I, I think if a, a result swings their way, it'll be a tall ask, Steve, going up against Belgium, who are essentially ranked number one in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. Stranger things have happened, um, and, and we'll wait and see. But but it, it, it's been great to see both Reitler and, and Lourdes over the course of the last few days. Yeah, uh, I, the thing about St. Petersburg is it's really far away from like everything and it, it, Russia is even farther like like Moscow is is even even farther away but I went to St Petersburg uh I don't know I guess it was quite a while ago at this point 15 years ago and uh yeah flew into Amsterdam and then flew to St Petersburg and it's uh it's a haul so you're coming from Europe like it's it's uh it's a ways even as sort of the most european of of the russian cities great city very odd and and sort of you know, it's it's an interesting mishmash of 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 stuff of sort of Western culture and sort of very distinctly Russian culture, and uh, it's a great place to be. It's also weird at this time of year because it's almost the longest day of the year, which is I think they have like three hours of darkness or something. I was there about this time, and it's yeah, it's called White Nights, and they it's just basically like you have to put the blackout curtains together on your hotel if you want to get any <laughs> if you want to get any sleep because there's no there's <laughs> there's basically no nighttime but uh a great spot i hope they have a good time there um drink some absinthe that's a thing that you can get in uh, in st petersburg um and, and some other good i had honey beer honey beer was really fantastic uh and um what else blintzes blinis those little those are great <clears throat> that's that's about my knowledge of Russia is that is that week I spent in in St. Petersburg. So uh, so Finland, as you said, uh, uh, have three points. They're in third right now in Group B. Uh, Slovakia uh, on top of Group E with with three points. Uh, Jan Gregus uh, didn't get much uh, run in their 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 opening game, but just Slovakia overall. How how, how did you feel? Yeah, fine. I, you know, I mean, I, I think um, in, in terms of Jan Gregus, Steve, it's not a surprise that he didn't start. I thought it was. Um, more than anything, I thought it was a little bizarre that they didn't go with the recognised centre forwards uh, in their opening game. Uh, Marek Hamšek played essentially a, a secondary striker role, uh, and, and not not quite. A, well, I guess you could you could say it was essentially a false nine, really, after watching him. But um, I thought it was interesting, um, but not surprised that that Gregus came on when he did, and we all know what he can offer and what he can do. Um, so when he came on, he was told to, from from what I saw, to slip into a midfield three and um, um, shore things up and retain possession. And, and I thought he did well in the in a little bit of time that he had. So um, that's his role. And and I think you know in in tournament, Steve, um, of course, Jan Gregorius wants to be starting and playing as many minutes as possible. Um, but sometimes in a tournament, you have to accept that you've got a certain role. And um, that, that can be said for for every aspect of, of football, for sure. Throughout the season, um, in a regular MLS season, there are players, particularly on Minnesota United roster and every other roster across the league, um, people will be told you, you you have a certain role this year. And, you know, let's use uh, Ramon Abila, for example. Ramon Abila, I'm sure moving forward, will be somebody who is, who is told your role this year is to come on for the last 20 minutes or 15 minutes or so. And if you need it, we need you to find a girl. That will be his role. And that's what he has to accept. Um, under this current uh, coaching staff. And it'll be the same for, for young Gregorius as well. He'll be told that you've got to go in to the centre of midfield um, for the last 15, 10 minutes or whatever, um, if, if needed, and you have to shore things up, keep possession, maybe help in a little transitional point of view if we need that as well. Um, but more, more so in, in tournaments than full season, Steve, do you see these... Um, certain types of situations where you have players that have specific roles because for, for a lot of these teams, Steve, obviously the tournament's only going to be three games. 
Yeah, I, a, a short short turnaround, probably not a lot of time to, uh, you know, again, with the travel and things like that, like make shifts in tactics and you're not, I think so much of the MLS season, I mean, you're right, it's it's different, you know, for, for different teams and it can be this way across a whole season, but a lot about a whole season of soccer is is coming to know the team to know who it's who they are themselves, you know, sort of like learning where everybody works. And there's these moments where, you know, a player steps in who does a fantastic job and then they sort of secure a role or it sort of can change, you know, the way the team feels or something like that. And you find that there's not really time for that in a tournament, which you're talking about three games. It's kind of like, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it as well as we can three times. And if we do it well enough, then, then maybe we can think about other stuff, but it's like, it's, it's, it's now or never. So, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that players have to go through. And I think any player like Jan Grego, who's been around the block knows that, you know, this is your time to do this. This is what you're going to be. And that's, and the better you can be at accepting that role, the more productive you're going to be. So um, yeah, it's, I mean, this is one of the reasons why tournament soccer is also, is also really exciting and it's going to be really fun to look forward to the rest of, uh, of the Euros here. Hopefully, I mean, I want them to do well, but I also want those guys to come back. So, uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. When injury takes you out of the game, it's time for your team to step up. At Alina Health Orthopedics, you'll get expert care backed by a whole health system of providers with convenient locations, virtual options, and an app that gives you 24-7 access to your records, test results, and care team. You're always close to the care you need. Schedule now at alinahealth.org slash ortho. Uh, one last little bit of international news uh, didn't play an active role, uh, but Dan St. Clair's uh, Canada men's national team has advanced to the final round uh, of qualifying for the CONCACAF World Cup qualifying. First time, I believe, since 1997 that Canada has made it to that uh, final round. So he's uh, he was on the on the bench, not uh, didn't didn't play in the game. This is again, it's one of those rough things with goalkeepers because you're kind of either playing the whole game or you're not. There's not a lot of chance for goalkeepers to come in and make a difference late in the game the way that a guy like Ramon uh, Abila or, you know, Jan Gregush might do. Um, that doesn't happen so much. But um, did you get to watch any of the, the, the Canada games? Yeah, I actually watched all of the game against Haiti last night, the 3-0 mm, nice. victory. Uh, it, it was about as convincing as they come. Um, there was um, perhaps one of the most, um, horrendous piece of goalkeeping um, I think I've ever seen, Steve. Um, for those who are um, watching, listening, um, if you haven't had the chance yet, I'd recommend you go and have a look on, online somewhere on social media or whatever it'll be there. Um, I forget the goalkeeper's name for Haiti, but um, it's a rather routine pass back to him. Um, he misjudges the, the, the direction and the pace of the ball and it sort of, as he lifts his leg up, it sort of goes through his legs. And then he's very close to the goal line. And then as he goes to, to clear the ball away, you know, when you're, when you're obviously kicking a, a football, you, you, your um, supporting leg plants on the ground first before you let your other leg go to kick the ball. Um, as he went to um, put his, uh, his supporting leg on the ground, his left leg, his left toe flicked the ball, meaning when he unleashed the, the kick to, to clear the ball away, uh, he missed the ball completely. And instead, the ball went in the back of his own net. Um, so there were two clear mistakes there from the goalkeeper. Um, and, and like I said, the name escapes me. I can't remember, but, but it, it, I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. Um, you know, in, in, in World Cup qualifying, you know, this, this is... This is a, a, a big stage, especially for a country like Haiti as well. Um, that's a massive stage. So to do that um, was not his finest moment. But Canada, Canada were, were about as, as dominant as they could have been against uh, an opponent like that, to be honest. You know, Kyle Lahren scored, um, and then uh, Junior Hallett came on and, and, and scored as well. And uh, Alfonso Davies was was his typical pestering self, you know, and, and there was... Um, uh, some good defensive displays as well from Daniel Henry. Um, uh, Vittoria was very, very calm and composed as well. Uh, the goalkeeper, uh, Borhan, didn't have much to do. Um, so it was about as, as, as straightforward as, as you could possibly imagine for Canada last night. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's exciting. Uh, I love, I love Canada as, as a place. Alfonso Davies has been really fun uh, to follow, you know, since the Minnesota United came into the league in 2017 and watching him with the white caps and watching him really mess up Minnesota United also, <laughs> but now he's out. He's, he's, he's in Germany, so we don't have to worry about him anymore, but uh, at least, at least within MLS, but a great, uh, it's a great, exciting uh, time for Canada. Obviously their, their, their men's national team is, is looking good. Like you said, a good, uh, solid, victory um so many good bands from canada man broken social scene arcade fire uh your your brian adams is your um alex trebek is from canada but he's not uh he's not a band but he's great r.i.p michael j fox fantastic uh bare naked ladies uh, my daughter loves the bare naked ladies so i'm 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 all in for canada except for their ketchup which is like sweet instead of salty so that's weird um but that's all i have to say about canada right now uh i love how you weigh in with the soccer analysis and then i just talk about food um FC Dallas. Let's do a little bit of uh, a, a previewing of FC Dallas. Um, let's talk about Dallas a little bit. They're at the bottom of the Western Conference right now, uh, which uh, is, is, is a place that Minnesota United is not unfamiliar with after the way the season uh, began. Do you feel like results so far for FC Dallas have been um, fair? Like, is being the, do you think they're going to end up, you know, at toward the bottom of the conference, or are they going to sort of get things together and, and climb up? I think I think with Dallas right now, Steve, um, they just need to get themselves a victory to get them, you know, to get the team back to where they should be, in my opinion, which is in and around the playoffs this season. Um, they are a good team. Lucha Gonzalez has got them playing some some good stuff, um, but for, for some reason, it, it's just not worked for them. We've only got the one victory so far this year. Um, I think um, the one thing I noticed when Minnesota last played them is, is perhaps they needed a little more protection. The back line needed a little more protection. Um, I think they, um, they try and play, well, at least I think it's Minnesota, they did anyway, they tried to play this high pressing um, style, which, which it, it's not going to work, Steve, when you've, when you've got someone like um, uh, Frank O'Hara up front, he, he's not someone who's going to press. Um, mm -hmm. I think they'll be much more suited to, to having one of the youngsters up there, you know, um, for example, like uh, Jesus Ferreira, he, he may, may not necessarily press as aggressively as they want, but he'd be certainly much quicker than, than Frank O'Hara. Um, even someone like Dante Seeley, you know, they, if they had a, a young gun that was willing to run uh, and press, then, then I think it would work, particularly on the road. But um, when, when Minnesota beat them at Allianz Field, um, you know, well, a couple of months ago now, I guess, um, it was, um, I, I thought it was fine for Minnesota. Obviously, they, they scored late with, with uh, Robin Lourdes. Um, but if memory serves me correct, they, they should have won that game handsomely anyway. But the, the point is there is that they, they got the win that, that they needed at that point. But I always thought um, during that game and, and other bits that I've seen of Dallas throughout the season, they need a holding midfielder. They need somebody who who is going to protect. Um, they've, they've gone and addressed that, Steve, in the transfer market. Um, and they've they've signed a, an Argentine midfielder uh, called Facundo Quitnon, who, who um, is a, a, a typical... Um, destroying number six, if you will, uh, but very good at passing the ball as well. Um, it's a combination of sort of a deep-lying, direct passer, but also is not afraid to get stuck in on a challenge as well. I saw him um, playing for Lanús in Argentina um, back in uh, in January and um, was impressed and, and, and I've sort of kept on watching uh, Lanús and, and other bits of Argentine football since then. But uh, I think it's a good sign. And the question is, I don't know if he's going to be available this weekend um, because I don't know if his ITC is going to be clear. I, I have no knowledge of that at all. But um, if he is available, um, it's, it's a very, very, well, regardless if he is or not, it's a very good signing for FC Dallas and will help them moving forward. Um, but I just don't know if he's going to be available this weekend or not. Um, so if, if he's not, then... Um, I think Luchi Gonzalez will have to figure some sort of way of, of stopping. We're assuming Emmanuel Reynoso is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Obviously, he um, he had a little bit of a knee issue, uh, which kept him out of the Salt Lake game. Um, he, he's been training. Um, he, he has looked okay. So one would assume he, he's going to be okay, but we, we don't know. Um, so, uh, look, if you, if you were to offer me a point now, Steve, I'd probably take it. Because going down to Dallas is is really tough, especially this time of the year as well. Um, I, I, think, I think knowing Adrian McAdoo, he'd probably want more. He'd probably want to go for the three points. Um, 
but I just think if you get a point away at Dallas, it's it's not a bad thing because then you you've got a really quick turnaround then because then you host Austin FC on the Wednesday at home and that that for me is where you've got to really pick up the points is when you're at home. But away, if you can get anything away, then that's great. Yeah, I mean it's. Um... You know, as far as Dallas, there's the Loons have never gotten a point at Toyota Stadium. Um, have have won, uh, have lost one game at home, uh, won five at home, but lost four there. So, it, you know, if you can get uh, a point, that would be a win. Um, in the sense of you got to walk before you can run. And I agree with you that as far as Austin FC, especially an Austin FC team that's an expansion side that beat you earlier this season at home during sort of that streak of ignominy that started the ignominy. It's like, you know, igno Minnesota. Uh, anyways, I'm already making puns in my, in my mind for this one. Anyways, um, it, it, to get back good against Austin after they beat you, that would be um, a big, that would be a big accomplishment. So, um, and I think one that would help feel, make, give the team that feel of turning around and, and, and getting back on that uh, the way that they expected to be playing uh, when the season when the season began, which uh, obviously it wasn't the case, but but has gotten better so far um, in the last several games. What uh, what kind of lineup shifts do you see? You know, presuming unavailability for for Lud, um, uh, Raitala, uh, and Jan Gregush. Um, you know, like uh, imagine Reynoso is, is healthy and he can play. How do you see you know Adrian adapting given some of those absences? I think it's a fairly obvious lineup if um, if Reynolds show is available, Steve. I think. Oh, I've lost. You were talking, but I've lost you. I can't hear your voice. I still can't hear your voice. What happened? <laughs> I think Cal's computer is about to crash. <laughs> well, he's gonna keep talking i'm gonna say what i think and then maybe it'll be what he thinks which i'm imagining he can give me the thumbs up if i'm right about this okay he's gonna come back um my thought I, you know i was sort of like hashing this out in my head a little bit and i imagine you get uh adrian unu up front uh hopefully for the the whole game but again with that knowledge that uh ramon uh avila could come in uh if you need a goal down the stretch you put uh franco fragapane who is hopefully available now finally um out left, you put Reynoso in the middle uh, of that uh, attacking those midfield three. You put Ethan Finlay on the right side, which is where Ethan always uh, has played and likes to be. And without Lud, uh, he's he's a fantastic option there. Uh, for that double pivot, Trap has played every minute of the season so far, so I would expect nothing less than than him coming in uh, into that double pivot alongside Hassani Dotson. I mean, I know that Dotson is a player that. Uh, Adrian Heath loves, uh, just signed him to a new three-year contract, which is exciting. Uh, it, again, as Kyle frequently said, he could be on the move. Eventually he has that kind of potential Cal feels, um, I know, but, uh, it, it nonetheless means that Hassan is going to be here and be a player for Minnesota United, which is fantastic. Uh, and again, Heath looks for every opportunity to get him into the team. So it seems like trap and Dotson together is a no brainer. Uh, and then you've got uh, Chase Gasper out wide at left. He's also played every minute so far of the season, um, which is tremendously exciting. And, uh, and then uh, Bakai Debasi is uh, coming back. He was back in the last game and looked good. Um, uh, Michael Boxall, another guy who's played every minute so far. And then you put Ramon Metanier on the right. And I think that's a pretty, Solid lineup. Um, obviously, Tyler Miller in goal at this point. He he was doing really well. I had not realized this. I mean, I knew he had stepped in and and then led uh, the the goal keep had been the goalkeeper for the last couple of games uh, as a shift. Which Adrian again sort of emphasized. This is not you know a referendum on um, on Dane St Clair or his abilities or anything like that. It's just sometimes you need. Uh, you know, someone to change uh, up how things are going. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is change your goalkeeper, sort of change the way things are going in the back line. Tyler Miller stepped in and done a fantastic job. Uh, he has, uh, I think he's the leader in the save percentage right now. Um, and that's uh, no mean feat uh, in the time that he's he's been playing. Uh, he's looked really good. So, oh, and Cal's back. <laughs> Can we hear you now? 
I still can't hear him. <laughs> nope. Wait, talk. Really? I, there you go. I can hear Have you. you got me? Have you got me? Now? I, there we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? I got you. Okay. So did you hear it? You, that's all right. You didn't. You didn't hear any of my line of predictions, I presume. So, no. Briefly, no, what, is, what is what is what is your line? We'll see if it's like this is like a secret quiz show game where like you don't know what my it's like the newlywed game. You don't know what my answers were. All right. What's your what's your what's your lineup front to back? Um, so against Dallas, my lineup, providing Reynoso is is okay, would, would be fairly simplistic, really, Steve. And you'd have Miller and goal. It'd be Metinier, Boxall, Debassi, and Gasper across the back line. It would be Trapp and Dotson in the centre of midfields, with Hansen, Reynoso, Fregapane behind Unu. Okay, that was pretty. Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's right. That's close. Ethan Finley is not fully healthy yet, is he? I don't think so. But okay. I don't know, no. actually. He was training today, so I'm not sure. I know he was training sort of separately, and I think he'd been sort of working his way back. So I had I had said uh Fragapane, Reynoso, Finley, um, if 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 Finley was ready. But Nico also looked fantastic in that last game. So, you know, I I certainly don't hate it. Do you think so? Do you think Nico is on the left and Fragapane is on the right, or do they switch? No, vice vice versa. And okay. I think to be honest, Steve, they'll probably interchange anyway throughout the yeah. game, depending on the situation. But I think Nico Hansen is deserving of the opportunity to start from the get-go. Um, he's been great in training. He is obviously working his way back from an injury. And, and as soon as he, he got himself um, fit and, and ready to go again after a wonderful pre-season, uh, he's been great in training and obviously came on uh, in the last game against Salt Lake and, and scored. I, I, I know it was um, fortuitous, the, <laughs> the goal for him, but um, he, he, he's still, you know, the, the stats don't lie. He scored. Um, and I think he's, he's deserving of a, of a start from the get-go, Steve. So I, I would go with Hansen on the right. I would go with Fragapane on the left um, because Fragapane is much more of an inverted winger. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then I would let Reynoso do whatever Reynoso wants to do, um, just give him the ball <laughs> and see what happens. But um, the, the interesting thing, though, Steve, what we're talking about this is, is Ampliant Unu. I'm interested to see again how, how he operates because I think against Salt Lake, he, he was... And, and I don't know this. I'm just from from my perception and from what I saw. Um, he he was asked to remain high up the field, which is not a surprise, particularly with the way that that the coaching staff want this team to play. But actually, I wonder moving forward, do we see him operate as much more of a shadow striker and as a false nine? Um, because I've been watching some tape of him um, when he was playing at Den over the the last couple of years, and there were times when. You know, a lot of the time he played in the three behind the forwards. And of course, there were times when he played as a centre forward, but he seems equally as comfortable behind as well. So I do wonder if we, we see him play as a shadow striker, as a, essentially a false nine. Um, and, and if you were to have him and Reynoso continuously swip swap, um, technical term, by the way, swip swap. Um, yes. If, um, if that's the case, <laughs> I think that would cause, I think that would cause chaos. Um, so we'll wait and see. It, it, it obviously depends on um, who they go up against. Uh, it depends on the certain situation. But I think when they have everything going their way, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we see Unu um, a little deeper than what we originally expected. But we'll wait and see because some, I also understand that, you know, on the road, you want to press as well. You want to ask the questions and force the issue as well. So um, we'll wait and see. But, but I think there's some options there for sure. I think that there are more options at centre forward through the one player than we originally thought. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we saw down the stretch of last season when when Lud was playing the false nine that having sort of, rather than having three guys and then a forward, if you have sort of four guys who can all kind of do a bunch of different things, it's it can be hard, I mean, it can, it can be a little difficult to get the most out of that uh, you know, in some ways, but also if you can sort of derange the defense a little bit and confuse who is going in there and going into the box. And Reynoso leads the team in shots right now. He's had 24 shots on goal. Um, he's not shy about shooting the ball. So, uh, and then also you got to imagine when Robin Lud comes back, he's somebody who's comfortable playing in that false nine role. Like if you never know who's going into the box and who's giving the service and who's sort of being the playmaker outside of the box, like it can be, it can be confusing and, uh, you know, frustrating for, for a defense. Uh, so I think that's the kind of thing it would be, it would be fun to see. I think that also makes for, for fun soccer uh, to watch as well. I wonder, Steve, like I said, if um, let, let's just say perhaps out of possession, 
do do Minnesota ask Unu to to press high and and make it awkward for for the team in possession? And then when in possession, do they ask him then to drop? Do they ask him to pull, to pull away from the centre half? Because as a centre half, then see what 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 can you do? Because if you follow the false nine automatically there's a massive gap behind you and with the way that the, the inverted wingers will cut in, there's a massive gap for them to exploit there. So um, I, I don't know. I, I'm really intrigued to see this. I just think now having had a bit more time to, to watch you new, um, both in the flesh, up in Blaine at the training centre and, and through various other contacts having sent me videos and stuff, um, I, uh, I think there's more to this player than what we originally thought and the original assumption was he's a pressing centre forward and like I said, I, I knew before that he he played in the three positions behind the centre forwards, um, but I, I never identified him as a, an out and out centre forwards. Um, but I just assumed that would be how he would be used. Um, so I, I wonder now, Steve. And again, it, it's entirely dependent on the circumstance and the situation that's presented to Adrian Heath. But I think um, there is a lot more to this player than what we originally thought, and it's going to be exciting to watch. Yeah, um, it, it'll be fun. Uh, this FC Dallas game is going to be really fun, and then obviously the return to the full stadium against Austin. We'll we'll save more about that for for next week. But I can just tell you, I'm really excited to be uh, watching uh, in a full stadium uh, soccer again. Uh, I'm sure you as well, especially given the um, the extent to which you rely to some extent on the vibe and the energy of the building to give you, you know, sort of to contribute to that. Uh, how much are you looking forward to that? Can't wait, Steve. Really, really can't wait. Um, you know, it, it's just not been the same really, has it? You know, the, the home games and, and credit to the 4,000 or also people that were in the stadium for those um, first couple of home games, because they, they did make it very, very loud. But um, you remember that, that last-minute goal against Dallas and the roar that came from the Wonder Wall and, and throughout the other parts of the stadium? Um, my, my mind was blown at that stage. I thought, this is so loud. And there's only 4,000 people in the stadium. Imagine, imagine when there's near full capacity. Um, it, it, it's going to be sensational, Steve. I can't wait. I'm so happy for the fans. You know, they've, they've waited so long for this. You know, the last time when we had essentially a full stadium, was that last playoff game uh, in 2019 against LA Galaxy? You know, you know, Zlatan Ibrahimovic was still in Major League Soccer. He's right. been at AC Milan now for nearly a year. You know, so it's been a long time. It's wild. Um, <laughs> so it, it, I'm really excited for the fans. I think they deserve this. You know, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what they've got up their sleeve as well in terms of chance and and supporting the team. It's going to be a great day, Steve. I can't wait. Yeah, it'll be great. Well, thanks for joining us for the 148th Sound of the Loons podcast presented by Alina Health Orthopedics. Be sure to leave us a nice review on iTunes or at the very least a five-star rating and follow the team on Twitter at MNUFC. You can follow Cal at Cal Williams Com, and you can follow me at Steve Enteris. Apologies, as always, to Richard Wagner. And remember, there's only one person in this whole world like you, and people can like you exactly as you are. <laughs>